Are we going toward another recession? It is very likely, if not a big yes. If not a big yes, it is very, very likely. There's both parties and a lot of economists and scholars are predicting another great recession. This is going to get really bad. It's not going to get better and better. For some people who think that things can go back to normal, uh, you're dead wrong. It's going to, like you heard from the elites and from our governments, it's going to go on for quite a while. So the Great Recession is going to be coming, and it could happen even probably sooner. So it might be really bad. Now, uh, here are some examples, and one of the most common examples is your gas price. So gas price is skyrocketing through the roof. Uh, this is from Local 12 News. They got it from the CNN News source. It's dated June 5, 2022. The title of their article is Most Expensive Gas in U.S. is in California. We are blessed. Bless God. Oh, my. Man, if, if this scared you enough, man, we're at the place. Most expensive gas in U.S. is in California at nearly $10 a gallon, according to Gas Buddy. All right, get ready, guys, all right? It's just going to get better and better, all right? We're building back worse, as they said, right? We're building back worse, as you've heard before. Now, uh, for gas prices, who do we blame, you know? It's Russia's fault, you keep hearing. It's Putin's fault, Russia's fault, Putin's fault, Russia's fault. So this is from a, a, a statistics source that's known for a highly uh, factual information on statistics. So this is from the Rasmussen Reports. Title of their article is, Voters Blame Biden for Higher Fuel Prices. Well, how much is it Putin's fault? Well, they mention right here in the details concerning about Biden is that the latest Rasmussen Reports National Telephone and Online Survey finds that 84% of likely U.S. voters believe the rising price of gasoline, home heating oil, and other petroleum products is a serious problem including 61% who say it's a very serious problem only 15% don't think rising fuel prices are a serious problem. Now, who are those jokers? Who are those numbskulls? You're going to find out who they are, and it's totally insane, these people. These people are totally insane. They're off their rockers. You wouldn't believe it. It's just so messed up nowadays. Uh, if you look at uh, other articles from the Rasmussen Reports, you'd be quite surprised. I think uh, the percentage of the voters who blame Putin is probably 30 percent if that's hard to believe actually <laughs> so believe it or not a lot of people are blaming biden in fact it's so bad with biden that it's not a secret this is from the washington post op-ed so the liberal democratic news source they even posted an article gas prices are through the roof that's just how biden wants it so this is what they said Here's the situation, Biden said at a Tokyo news conference on May 23rd. When it comes to the gas prices, we're going through an incredible transition that is taking place that, God willing, when it's over, will be stronger and the world will be stronger and less reliant on fossil fuels. So see, it's not a secret, okay? It's not a secret. Oh, my goodness. Uh, how insane is this world getting to? You're saying, you're telling me, Pastor, that there are some fools out there that are actually saying, we welcome higher prices. This is actually good for us? Yes. This is from NPR, okay? Title of their article, Environmentalists Quietly Welcome High Gas Prices. Of course they were doing it quietly. Why? Because if they said it publicly, like this idiot, Stephen Colbert, then they get a lot of hot water. Title of the article from Fox Business, Megan McCain rips Stephen Colbert's solution to surging gas prices. Okay, this is what he said, all right? Get ready to get a blessing and shout amen, all right? 
pay the average gas price in America hit an all-time record high of over four dollars per gallon okay that stings but a clean conscience is worth a buck or two I'm willing to pay four dollars a gallon I'll pay fifteen dollars a gallon because I drive a Tesla Wow, what a blessing. Amen, right? Amen. How many of you got a blessing? Raise your hand, all right? Let's open up altar call. You know what the you know what the lesson is? The lesson is we should all buy a Tesla, bless God, all right? Oh my goodness. Now, you can imagine the in uh, the anger of the people after they heard that. They're like, "Hey, I don't have as much money like you, Colbert, where I can get myself a Tesla." Uh, these people nowadays uh, here's something even better. You ready for this? The New York Times, title of their article, uh, You Want to Buy Meat, and that's in this economy. And if you read that article, they're saying, this is actually really good for us about in price inflation because it will switch us to buy veggies and we can finally have a green diet. Now that's a doctrine of devils, isn't that? Hey, do you never read 1 Timothy 4? All right, you just read that in your spare time, okay? If you ever read the Bible. That's a doctrine of the devil. That's not extremism. You just don't read your Bible. Read 1 Timothy 4, and you will see that. Now, with all of this happening, the concern is, wow, with all of this going on around our world, what's going to happen to us? Well, I believe that this is paving the way for fulfilling Scripture. So it might be that one day we might get to low prices again, but know this, it's not going to last forever. It's not going to last that way. It will return to surging gas prices beyond your wildest imagination because it's fulfilling Scripture. Go to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Now, a lot of people... Don't give this interpretation of Revelation 6, which is surprising to me, but I could probably guess why. But I'm going to show you that in Revelation chapter 6, where the Bible says when those four horsemen are cut loose, then the future, it's paving the way for the third horseman, famine. And when famine comes in, the thing that they're going to be sensitive about for inflation and prices and everything is going to be the gas. Look at Revelation chapter 6. And then look at verse 6. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the what? Oil and the wine. So they don't want you to touch the oil and the wine. If you look at Dr. Ruckman's apocalypse video, he, d he quoted that verse and showed the Antichrist or a devil where he was controlling gasoline tanks. So touch not the oil and the wine. Majority of people don't see it that way, and the reason why is actually for good reason, believe it or not. So I'm not really hard on these people. It's because they deem the oil to be food. Because usually oil and wine, there was no petroleum oil that time. So because of that, it's natural for them to think that this is going to be food oil. But I'm giving you a different interpretation, I believe that it is very possible, I'm not going to say it's foolproof, but it's very possible, it's referring to petroleum oil, believe it or not. I'm going to show you scripture for that one. I'm going to show you scripture for that one. So could it be referring to food oil? Yes, I can be open to that, verse 6, but I don't believe when, you, especially you interpret prophecy, you stick to one interpretation. It's very important that you keep alternative options open that way when prophecy gets fulfilled because let's be honest you and i are not going to be all the time right with prophetic interpretations when it comes to prophecy interpretations of prophecy especially when you get deep into talking about the future not all the time you and i will be accurate that's why it's always important to keep alternative opinions open yeah. on that one now there are some things that is definitely black and white, okay? We've learned that in prophetic interpretation, basic dispensationalism, but when you get into deep stuff, then that's where you have to be careful, right? So, 
understand that I am being open-minded, that this can be food oil, but I'm also asking you to do the same courtesy in return. You got to be open-minded that it could be petroleum, fuel, uh, petroleum oil because of Matthew 25. Go to Matthew 25. Now notice what the scripture deems oil right here. The scripture deems oil not something you use for food, but for fuel. You use it for fuel, not for food. Look at Matthew chapter 25. Look at verse 3. They that were foolish took their what? Lamps, Lamps and took no what? Oil. oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. How about that? Look at verse 8. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Notice that the Bible it uses the interpretation of oil here as fuel. Fuel. Now, some people might say, well, yeah, it's referring to fuel oil. I can acknowledge that, but it's not petroleum oil right here. They're using olive oil. Well, I can understand that, but they, that shows something of a limited knowledge of prophetic interpretation. Let me explain right here. In prophetic interpretation, what can pretty much all Christian scholars generally agree with, with the book of Revelation? When the author is using words in the book of Revelation, he can't say Tesla right here. It's not going to say petroleum right here. He is going to use the word in the future that best fits in his language and understanding. Isn't that prophetic interpretation throughout scriptures? Even the Old Testament, yeah. when they prophesied about the Messiah and Christ? Sure, so then a lot of times they'll use those words and those terms. A lot of times, uh, a good example is the Bible won't mention about cars, yeah. but it'll mention about running to and fro. Yeah. When in the future, you're going to get such kind of civilization and technology increase that it's going to speed things up. So see, when you take the word, you got to figure out what the author is trying to intend right here. So... When he's going to talk about gasoline in Revelation 6, he's not going to use his, he's not going to use petroleum. That's a future word. Yeah. Well, what's the best word that'll fit that? Oil. And in his mind, oil that's used as fuel. Yeah, and guess what? Matthew 25 has used it in that sense. If you look at the bo book, all the books in your Bible that talk about oil, it'll be used as food or fuel or something that has to do with anointing or aroma. That's the idea. So why don't you be open to fuel, especially when you're seeing these times that we're in, it makes a lot of sense about not hurting the oil when famine comes in, right? What do you mean by famine? I believe as well, I'm going to show you uh, very interesting stuff in your Bible. I believe that when famine comes in in the tribulation, it's going to affect, it is tied to gas. It is tied to oil. You might say, why? Because when there's inflation in oil, especially when you're looking at these time, it's affecting food prices. Now, I'm going to show you these articles right here. The title of the article from Epoch. Price of food in America set to spike in the fall. Goya CEO on looming food crisis. Wow, how about that? Here are more articles about the food crisis in case some of you didn't know about that. Remember that New York Times article I mentioned about inflation is that it's a good thing. Why? So that we can switch to veggies. That's another example right there. Another example about food prices spiking is, this is from CNBC, even the liberals admit this. Title of their article, Families Will Skip Meals to Deal with the Cost of Living Crisis, UN Special Advocate Says. So even UN, even UN Special Advocate is speaking on that matter. How about that? This food crisis is a pretty big deal, guys. It's a pretty big deal, and it's actually very scary. Let me show you one interesting thing in the Bible. 
Now, we're not going to look at all these verses because there's 28. I can't turn to all 28. Isn't it interesting that when you look at Revelation 6, it talks about famine, correct? When it talks about famine coming out, it connects it with oil, right? All right. Whatever it is. It could be fuel. It could be food. Whatever. But I would like to show you why this fuel oil would be a more likely possibility. Because when you look at today's current events, what's going on, current events is evidence that when oil has an inflation with the prices, food will be affected. We've seen those examples. But another example is scripture. You might say, how so? Isn't it interesting that in the scriptures, well, let's, before we go to the scriptures, let's look at today. With price inflation, what's the blame they're giving to, supposedly? It's that war going on, right? And another reason for inflation is because of the disease going on, right? Or the pandemic. Now, isn't it interesting in Revelation 6, what accompanies famine? War and death. But you know who death is referring to when you compare Revelation 6 with Matthew 24? Yeah. It's disease, yeah. pestilence. Mm -hmm. Let me show you another one. That's just one scripture. Look up nearly every time, nearly every time, the Bible says famine. Isn't it interesting that when God sends a judgment on famine or famine happens, there's always two other guys, pestilence and war. You know that? Let's look at some examples, okay? I'll, I'll quote some examples. So here are uh, 28 verses, and if you look up famine and pestilence together, then there's going to be 28 verses. Look up when the Bible says famine, you'd be surprised how many times war and pestilence can follow along that. 2 Samuel 24, 13, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land? Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies, war, or that there be three days pestilence in thy land, disease? Here's another one. First Chronicles 21, uh, no, that's the uh, same thing right here. Second Chronicles 20, verse 9, Solomon's prayer. If when evil come upon us as the sword, see, war, judgment or pestilence, disease, or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence. Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 12. When they fast, I will not hear their cry, and when they offer burnt offering and an oblation, I will not accept them, but I will consume them by the sword, war, and by the famine, and by the pestilence, disease. Here's another one. Jeremiah 21, verse 7. And afterwards, saith the Lord, I will deliver Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his servants and the people, and such as are left in this city from the pestilence, from the sword, and from the famine. Here's another one. There, there's so much in Jeremiah. I have to skip all of the verses in Jeremiah. Okay? Let's go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 5, 12. A third part of these shall die with the pestilence. So a third part of the people are going to die by pestilence, and with famine shall they be consumed in the midst of thee, and a third part shall fall by the sword round about thee. Oh, how about that? Uh, Ezekiel mentions it quite a lot of times, so I have to skip that down. Now, isn't that interesting that when God sends a national judgment, when God sends a national judgment or a judgment on a nation, he will always use those three things that the, those three horsemen do at Revelation 6. Wow, I love that, yeah. How about that? Isn't that interesting? So there is no doubt this is a tendency of what God does. So why is America going through this? Simple, you don't read your Bible. You don't see what God tends to do with nations who forget God, who reject God. You'll find out the reason why these judgments happen to the nation is because of their immorality and their sin and their rejection of God.
People always gives all kinds of different arguments and explanations about why these things happen. But let's be very honest. It's, so, it's simpler than you think. It's because you rejected God. But let's go by the secular arguments and then see how the scripture words it. All right. This is going to be even more eye opening. We're going to go through uh, the economic arguments right here. We're going to go through the economic arguments and I'm going to blow your minds by showing you that there's scripture to show it as well. All right, go to Ecclesiastes 5. Ecclesiastes 5. Bible study is so boring, isn't it? You know, it won't, the Bible is so outdated it can't tell you how to solve national issues or economic problems, huh? All right, title of the article from Fox Business. What is a recession, and should, America's, uh, should Americans be worried? So yes, and then they give three reasons why. The three popular reasons, they say one is overheating. Okay, so I wrote down three things right here. One is overheating. What is overheating? It means that demand outpaces supply. Has two key characteristics, rising inflation and unemployment being low its natural rate, which causes growth to occur at an unsustainable, unsustainable rate. Although it can be sustained temporarily, spending will eventually fall in order for supply to catch up to demand. Well, that's the economic explanation. Well, the Bible was way ahead of you. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Look at this one. I love how scripture always confounds the wisdom of the mighty. Notice in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and then we'll look at verse 13, verse, uh, verse 11, verse 11. When goods increase, they are increased that what? Eat them. Look at that. The demand is eating up the supply. How about that, huh? And what good is there to the owners thereof? See, what good is it to those owners who supply it? Saving the beholding of them with their eyes. That's right. All it can do is just show you a virtual reality of those things yeah. that you want. Because those things are getting grabbed and prices are going higher and higher and it's hard to grab those goods, isn't it? Here's the second reason. A second reason is what they call asset bubble. Asset bubble. And that ties with the globalists, the elites, and what the Antichrist is going to do, which is why the economy is falling apart. It's a different type of overheating known as an asset bubble, they say here. Although neither featured a large increase in price inflation, both featured the rapid growth and subsequent bursting of asset bubbles. The 2001 recession, so how that happened, was... Uh, preceded by the dot-com bubble burst, and the 2007 to 2009 recession was preceded by the housing bubble. Asset bubbles develop when the economy, so it's explaining what those asset bubbles are, develop when the economy is thriving and investors in a particular asset purchase large quantities of that asset on the belief that it will sell for a higher price. But if those asset prices plummet, and if enough people had significant exposure to that asset, it could drain the value of people across the country. So then that's why Hollywood put out a movie, I think it's called The Big Short, where they were putting the blame of the recession and everything going on, especially about that housing bubble and the issue with housing, to the banks. So those globalist elites, those big bank heads, they have some, there is a secular economic explanation to that. It's not conspiratorial, see? It's not a conspiracy. But let's keep reading Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Didn't the Bible say that? The Bible says in 13, verse 13, there is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun, namely riches kept for the owners, thereof to their what? Hurt. But those riches perish by evil travail. Why? And he begat the son, and boom, there is nothing in his hand. Gone. How about that? Verse 16, And this also is a sore evil, that in all points as he came, so shall he go. And what profit hath, 
hath he that hath labored for the wind. All his days also he eateth in darkness, and he hath much sorrow and wrath with his sickness. How about that? Can't those verses be applied to asset bubbles? How about that? Notice how the Bible already tells you and warns you some things. It's way ahead of you. Here's another one. Another one is economic shocks. Third, what is economic shock? Okay, economic shocks, it says, recessions aren't always caused by some type of overheating. Negative unexpected external events, referred to as shocks by economists, have the power to disrupt growth. So here's one example. Obviously, you can guess it has to do with the war, and it has to do with the pandemic situation. It says right here about that pandemic, which triggered one of the most severe but briefest recessions in U.S. history, also represented an external shock as the <laughs> forced an unprecedented shutdown of the nation's economy. The economy lost 22 million jobs and unemployment surged to 14.7%, the highest since the Great Depression. And then guess what's tied to it? Always. For instance, in 1979, oil output dropped by about 4% as a result of the Iranian Revolution, causing mass panic, which then drove prices higher. The price of crude oil more than doubled to $39.50 per, per barrel. The shock pushed the U.S. and other countries into a recession. Oh, <laughs> today is much worse now. So we see right here that it's economic shocks that are the issue. Well, who's the one who's responsible for those external events? And then produces the economy and help you flourish. Why? Look at verse 18. Behold that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink, and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he hath taken under the sun all the days of his life. Who is the cause of all this external events? Which God giveth him, for it is his portion. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. So notice right here that God's the one responsible for riches. So we see at Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 5 and verse 11, it matches right here with overheating. We see in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and then verse 13, all the way down to verse uh, 17. Verse 17, you can apply that to those asset bubbles. And then you see at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 18 through 19. Who's responsible for that sh economic shock? It's not a shock if you're a Christian. You know what it is. It's referring to the Lord. God is in control. Amen? I mean, think about it. Uh, this is a little bit of a sermon right here. You're scared of those economic shocks? shocks? Who's in control of those economic shocks? Isn't when gas prices go higher and there's inflation and everything, isn't God still in control over your money and your life? You freak out when you spend a lot of money, but who's the one who provided you the money? See? So don't depend more on economic shocks more than the Lord. The Lord's the one who sent those economic shocks. Why? Very simple, because of judgment. God is sending down judgment in this nation. So we're going to look at several passages that definitely prove and explain that. Look at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Now notice this is church age Christian doctrine. So this is not uh, happening at the tribulation with war, famine, and pestilence. No, the Bible points out that these economic shocks, these external events, can happen in the church age. Nations can receive their judgment. They don't have to wait till the tribulation. They get it now. And Romans 2 is the evidence for that one. We're going to look at Romans Chapter 2. Obviously, the seals of wrath concerning war, famine, disease are not 
unleashed yet. They're not, uh, they're not unleashed yet. But some of these movements and some of those precursors and a little bit of their activity are falling down upon this nation. There is no doubt about that. And let's look at Romans chapter 2, verse 4. This is church age doctrine. So guess what, guys? You don't have to wait till the tribulation. You can get it right now, pretty much. Look at Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Or despisest thou the what? Riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Okay, look at verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent, impenitent heart, right? Visitation today? Oh, I don't need that. I don't need salvation. I don't need Jesus. I'm a Christian. You should stop doing that. Right? Hardness and impenitent heart. People rejecting God. Look at this. Treasurest up unto thyself, what? Wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. But look at this. Verse 8. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth. Is that today? Yeah, they don't want the truth. They replace it with lies. When you want to be a truther and find out the truth, they reject it. They don't want you to see that. And if you do not obey the truth, what happened? But obey unrighteousness, indignation, and so what the Bible says is, but obey unrighteousness. So the people who choose unrighteousness instead, what happens to them? Indignation and wrath, tribulation. Wow, we don't have to wait for that official big tribulation with the Antichrist. The Lord can send a miniature version of those tribulations right now. Yeah. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Well, this is only Jewish application. No, of the Jew first and also of the what? Gentile. Gentile. But look at this, but glory, honor, and peace. Look at that. Glory, honor, and peace. Look at the physical prosperity involved, right? Wow. Which matched with uh, verse 4 with God's riches. Yeah, come on. To every man that worketh what? Good. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God. See, it's not a dispensational, rightly, uh, only selected for a certain group. No, God don't see it that way. With every nation that rejects God, he applies a judgment. And you will see that in Old Testament and New Testament. God always sends down a judgment on a nation. From beginning to end, he never stopped, in, no matter what dispensation it was. How about that? So, those quote-unquote economic shocks is founded at Romans chapter 2 and verse 8 and 9. Those, there's your economic shocks. God's the one who sent them. God's the one who sent them. So, the solution is is if you want economic prosperity, I heard all the arguments, you know, the key line pipe into Canada, the environmentalists are putting the restrictions, and then other people saying, no, it's not the Green Deal's fault because it didn't officially lay out on the table yet, or, you know, uh, it's all of OPEC, or the USA could dig up its oil, or, you know, it, it is all Russia's fault because there's a uh, global uh, effect with everything. So even though U.S. can have and run its uh, own oil, so to speak, the reason why the prices are going up is because of those gas companies' fault, because of that. It's a global effect, even though it doesn't really affect the gas because it affects global. I read all of that. I studied all of that. You know what I think about all of that? Yeah. Kaput compared to Scripture. Because I see pros and cons with no matter what party inside you're on. All right, there's always a weakness in every argument, but there is no weakness in this argument. You get right with God, Amen. and then the Lord's going to take care and provide your needs. You want evidence? Look at us in this economic shock. The Lord took pretty good care of us, Amen. even though we don't think so and worry because we keep looking at the economic shock rather than Jesus Christ. And when you say your eyes on Jesus Christ and not look at the economic shock, what happens when you see those bills going really high? You go, I'm okay, because God answered my prayer before, he's going to answer it again. See, you got to be looking at that. That's your evidence that you're being provided for, is God's hand in providing your need and the promise of his word by faith. 
So look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is the best economic argument, all right? The best economic debate, all right? If they want to explain, well, the reason why is overheating, acid bubble, and economic shock, and etc. Hey, man, the scripture is already way ahead of you. But it comes down to the bottom line is, if you believe there is a God who created all the universe and the external things in this universe, then he's the one also in control of these external things, is he not, if he's the creator of the universe it's itself? First yeah. Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor what? Trust in uncertain riches. Man, that King James Bible is way ahead of you. Those riches, the economy, the Bible says it's uncertain. The Dow, and then, you know, you keep looking at those stats, you know. You know what that is? Uncertain. It's not certain, it's uncertain. How about that? Man, Scripture is, man, so economic, isn't it? It's so way ahead of you, man. It says, don't trust in uncertain riches, but in the what? Living God, who giveth us richly, what? All things to enjoy. God's the one in charge of that. God's the one in charge of that. So, I mean, when you're reading all this stuff, all you have to do is look at who's in control. God's the one in the throne. He is in control over all of this, and he is also in control over here too. So, he is in control of your riches. So, I want you to get right with God today and serve him and start be living your life as a Bible-believing Christian. Amen. And then let's see him get to work in your life now, finally, after that. Cool. Aren't you sick and tired of keeping, uh, being so stubborn in doing things your way? Haven't you had enough? Look how mankind did their own way without God. It, they're doing such a good job, isn't it, guys? They're doing such a good job. <laughs> All right, Proverbs chapter 14 and 22. Proverbs chapter 14, Proverbs 14, and Proverbs 22, Proverbs 14, and Proverbs 22. People say it's Putin's fault, Biden's fault, whatever. The point is scripture was way ahead of you. The Bible told you the reason why riches are falling apart is because you're putting your faith in in, in fools. And when you put your faith in fools, people who aren't dumb, people who are like, trying to shake somebody's hand when no one's there. And then the Easter bunny has to correct your mistake. That's your fruit. Why? Bible already warned you that would happen. The Bible already warned you that would happen with your riches, that your faith would go now toward a fool. Look at Proverbs. I mean, look at the Scripture. Scripture is always way ahead of you. Look at Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 24. The crown of the wise is their what? Riches. If you get smart people in charge, then you're going to have your economy going up. But the what? Foolishness of fools is folly. See, instead you get folly. Welcome to the circus today. This is what you're seeing. It's a circus. It's a folly show. That's what you're seeing every time now. All right, let's look at uh, Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22. And verse 4. Proverbs chapter 22. We'll read verse 4. I also want to make sure that the archive is recording the too. Archive okay, is recording all right then. The, the live stream just went high okay then. So let's look at Proverbs chapter 22, verse 4 then. Now look at this. You, you want to get rich again? The, the nation to start going up? Come on. Verse 4. By humility yeah. and the fear of the Lord are what? Rich. Riches and honor and life. That's how you can get it as a nation. Now, I get it that uh, I'm not saying that this is irrefutable. There are times, let's be honest, that Christians who live for the Lord, they go through persecution, right? They still go through suffering, right? So this is not a prosperity gospel thing. But what I'm trying to point out is this. What I'm trying to point out is, let's be honest, generally, when you live in a moral life, when society and a nation does morals correctly and stomp down sin, don't you think that the tendency is that life will get better? Yeah, life does get better. So that's why you have to understand that. Okay. 
Now look at Deuteronomy 32. I'm going to go as so far as to say that I can even show you scripture where God will provide you even gasoline. God's the one in charge of your riches where he can even provide gas for you. All right. Now let me show you some interesting scriptures on that. Man, the scripture is way ahead. I love to say that all the time. Look at Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. Now, petroleum, you know what that word comes from? So obviously that's a word that's not found in your Bible because petroleum is that English modern word. But remember, the Bible, your King James Bible, was originally from Latin, for some of you who didn't know that. It came from Latin. The first languages were Hebrew and Greek, but then after that, the whole caboodle was Latin. So then one of the manuscript evidence for the King James Bible is the Old Latin from 2nd century, which has been uh, pr uh, proven by uh, some interesting works. Which Bible by Davis Otis Fuller is one of them that I'd highly recommend. Uh, Biza, the famous scholar Theodore Biza, even mentioned about 2nd century for Latin manuscripts. But anyways, let's not talk about that. Let's go back here. Uh, returning to the point, the King James Bible originally was written in Latin. And then guess what uh, petroleum means in Latin? It comes, petroleum comes originally from the Latin word rock oil. Rock oil. Now look at Deuteronomy 32. And verse 13, the Bible says, He made him, that's God, right on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the fields. And he made him to suck honey out of the rock, and what? Oil out of the flinty rock. Whoa! Job 29. Job 29. Now, I'm going to say this like I said before. Sure, it could be probably referring to olive oil, just like we've seen in Revelation 6. But like I argued for Revelation 6, you better keep also be open-minded to the fact that this could be referring to petroleum. Look at Job chapter 29 and verse 6. Job 29, verse 6. Man, the scriptures is so much fun. <laughs> Look at Job 29, verse 6. The Bible says, When I washed my steps with butter, and the what? Rock poured me out rivers of oil. And who's the one in charge of that? Verse 4. When the Almighty was yet with me. See, God's the one responsible for every time you put that gas in your tank and go, yeah. cha-chung, 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 cha-chung. Isn't that interesting? Look at Exodus chapter 2, verse 3. Oh, you, you think you can solve the gas price inflation with Scripture? Absolutely. Absolutely right. Because you're scripturally ignorant, that's the reason why you have issues with price inflation and gases. Gas, excuse me. But let me tell you this. The Standard Oil Company, when one of the places that got started with oil, you know how the Standard Oil Company got, was able to produce the oil and all that was able to commence? It's because some ignoramus, some dummy, looked at the scriptures at Exodus chapter 2. Wow. And they sent one of their researchers, one of their specialists. His name is Charles Whitshot. Charles Whitshot. And he, you can look it up yourself. The story, that name, Charles Whitshot, and Exodus chapter 2, verse 3. Do your own research. And all you have to do is look up those two terms. When they read Exodus 2, verse 3, it said, And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch. When they read that, they were wondering, I wonder if this area or the areas nearby here at Exodus chapter 2, verse 3, that there can be oil. Guess what? Struck oil. Wow. Yeah, just read your Bible. Yes, I'm that foolish to think so. Amen. I'm that much of a dummy to think so. You're so wise to not go by the Bible and look how well we're doing. Oh, you know, we're doing so well. Ten dollars. Yay. How many of you are happy? We can go green too with our meals and skip meals. Isn't that wonderful? 
Man, what a great life, man. How wise the wisdom of the so-called wise and the scholars and the economists and Wall Street, the bankers, the globalists of today. Aren't they so smart? Look at Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. The scripture is so amazing. It'll blow you up every single time. You know that? Amen. It'll just explode your mind beyond <laughs> what you could probably even ask or think as one scripture goes, right? It's so amazing, the scriptures. Always alive, always so real, always ahead and prophetic. Now, you got to look at the sinister things behind the scenes. What's all of this coming down to? It's not a matter of blaming Biden or Putin. It's even darker than that. It's beyond that. It is surreal. It is real, actually. It is actually real spiritual forces at play, dark forces at play. Uh, demonic spirits using certain elitists in power where they can have more control so that it can pave the way for the, ultimist, for the ultimate elitist, the Antichrist. That's all what this is coming down to. Because you might wonder why, and I'm going to give you some interesting news here. With inflation going sky high, it is not a secret that housing is also getting affected. So right now, housing is getting affected. Everyone's being concerned about that. So who are the ones who benefit out of it? Title of the article from Vox, Wall Street isn't to blame for the chaotic housing market. But then, when they mention right here, if you keep reading the article, is that black, uh, they quote one company from a tweet a guy from BlackRock, they say right here, BlackRock uh, is pursuing an investment strategy that will make it harder for young Americans to own homes. They are just grabbing a lot of homes. If you look at the statistics from BlackRock and Blackstone, it is actually crazy, guys. But they're hoarding uh, and they're Ben, they're, they're the ones that are benefiting out of all the things from the housing market. If you look at, uh, some people say, when you look up the ultimate banks and the ultimate uh, elitists and globalists, yeah. they put BlackRock as one of the top, actually. They put BlackRock as one of the top. What is this all coming down to with inflation? So then, the concern is this that you hear. The concern is, then it affects housing, right? And then once it affects housing, then who's the one that ultimately is in charge and in control when people are in need of land and food? It's those rich guys who own it on top. It's those globalist elitists on top. So then they're the ones that own, and then the fear is, God forbid, that people find it more comfortable kind of like what we're doing. We can't own property now, so we pay rent, right? So it becomes more comfortable for some people sometimes to let somebody else who's in charge of owning all that to give them the benefit, to give them the housing and the food. Eventually, it'll come back to the dark ages maybe, right? Of how uh, certain rich elitists were in charge of plots and portions of land and, God forbid, even food itself. That's a concern with the people. But the evidence is actually from a spe specialist website, Birch Gold Group. And they were the ones who uh, specialize and they can study and they'll tell you all the professional details about who benefits off of this. The title of their article is Housing Prices Reveals Fatal Flaw Hidden in Fed's Monetary Policy. Some of this is pretty disturbing of what I'm going to read for you. It says right here, I'm going to read this portion of the article. When, when Fed governors fan out to tell people that they want to 
cut rates in order to create more inflation. And when the media, including the New York Times and NPR, promote this as a beneficial goal and as something the Fed should do, they're clearly taking the side of corporate America to enhance corporate uh, America's revenues and profits. They also mention right here a lot of interesting details. House price inflation in the U.S. was 42% according to the Case-Shiller Index, and by the met, by metro area, it was 58% in the Dallas-Fort Worth metro, 65% in Denver, 78% in the Seattle metro, and 82% in the San Francisco Bay Area. I think, from what I research, San Francisco Bay Area is the worst, actually. It's the worst right now. Assets are highly leveraged. When their prices rise, these higher prices are used as collateral for more debt, meaning banks and bondholders are on the hook when prices turn the other way, as asset prices do. And this is when asset price inflation leads to, you guessed it, a banking crisis and a broader financial crisis. So notice right here that they admit at the end that there is a certain group or elitist or selected group that gets the benefit out at the end. And then you people are the one that are uh, suffering the brunt of everything. But guess what? Scripture even pointed that to you. We don't learn from history in the scripture. You know where it is? Genesis. Go to Genesis. The beginning of beginnings. Sometimes Genesis repeats yeah. Revelation. Isn't it interesting? Look at the book of Genesis, and we'll look at Genesis chapter 47. Genesis chapter 47. Now look at this system. If this happened with nations before, then you got to look at your current nation. Are you repeating a historical evidence, a historical pattern of other nations, what they did? Look at this. This is what happens. Look at Genesis chapter 47. Look at verse 14. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan for the corn which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when money failed, see, price inflation economy, uh, price inflation eventually turns to an economic bust or, or failure. When money failed in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph. Now look at this appeal. This appeal to a socialist lifestyle, an appeal to we will worship, practically even give our own bodies to this one world ruler. Look at this. Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money faileth. And Joseph said, give your cattle, and I will give you for your cattle if money fail." But what happens? The cattle fail. Look at verse 18. When that year was ended, they came unto him the second year and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord how that our money is spent. My Lord also hath our herds of cattle. There is not aught left in the sight of my Lord, but our bodies and our lands. Look at uh, verse 20. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. Look at that. All for one elitist. One big globalist owns all the land now of the people. Because of what? Price inflation, economic downfall, food, prices going up. For the Egyptians sold every man his field because the famine prevailed over them, so the land became Pharaoh's. How about that? How about that? What men learn from history is that what? Men never learn from history. Do you see glimpses of that happening in, of Genesis right now? Go back to Daniel 11. The, it will happen in the tribulation. Now the evidence that it will happen in the future is Daniel 11. Notice what the Antichrist will do when he comes down. Look at Daniel chapter 11. Dividing, of land, dividing land for gain. We see Daniel chapter 11. And then we also see a historical pattern, historical evidence of that which is the book of Genesis. And it was chapter, uh, I lost the chapter, was it 47? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, thank you, 47. We also seen the historical evidence and the pattern. 
with current events matching up with what can happen with Revelation 6, as well as the historical evidences and the pattern of how God did it with war, famine, and disease always accompanying each other. Now, look at Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. The Bible says right here in verse 24, He, the Antichrist, shall enter peaceably, even upon the fattest of the places of the province, and he shall do which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. See, he's the one who holds all the pot. And he's the one that can divide it and spread them out. Look at another example. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 11 and verse 39. 39. Then shall he do in the most strongholds with the strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause him to rule over many, and shall what? Divide the land for gain. So he, there, notice an ownership of land and property, and he's the one that can divide it off for gain. That's why people right now, they're not stupid. Some people are saving up money to buy property so that they can become landlords themselves because they know that's where all the money is. So, believe it or not, Scripture is way ahead of you, as I've repeated many times. You just have to go by the Bible, then you know. But it's much worse than this. It's not elitist having power. It's darker than this. It's this one. It all leads down to a digital currency. You might say, why? When there's this price inflation and everything, do you know why people are going Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, and everything? Because they think that's a haven and a protection from actually price inflation and the economic failures and money failure. Didn't you know that? This is actually pointed out evidence. They did a research paper evidence. Title from Science Direct is Inflation and Cryptocurrencies Revisited, a time scale analysis. And what they showed is very interesting. We analyzed the relationship between cryptocurrencies and forward inflation expectations. You know what they found out? They found out that there is a relationship, that there is a connection or a relationship where inflation expectations and cryptocurrency is strong. But this is not in research cause and effect, which is even scarier. You know what they said? But there's no proof that uh, with inflation going higher, that cryptocurrency is that haven and protection. So you know what that is? I'll tell you what that is. It's so scary. What it's showing to you then is the connection, the relationship is because people are going crypto or digital currency because they think it's a cause and effect that it'll protect them from inflation. So that's a relationship. So that's why there's a lot of people doing that. But guess what? There's no proof of cause and effect for that. So in other words, no, it doesn't protect them from inflation. The cryptocurrency. Isn't that scary? The basic interpretation now is this, okay? I'm trying to interpret from research paper point of view to basic language now, okay? Bottom line is this. Bottom line is people originally, what that research paper is showing out is this then. People are switching to cryptocurrency because they're scared of inflation, all right? Because of inflation going up. But there is no evidence that switching to crypto protects them from inflation. That's what it means, guys. Isn't that scary? That's really scary. When I read that article, I was like, wow. Because if you look at a lot of articles, there's no cause and effect. Uh, forget cause and effect. Speak easy English. Okay, so there is no proof, guys, that when you go crypto, that you're going to be, or Bitcoin, you're going to be protected from inflation. There's a lot of researchers on that. But nevertheless, there are so many articles out there, people don't care and they just switch <laughs> to Bitcoin crypto. You know what that is? If the Antichrist goes digital where you buy and sell, this is a scary thought. People go for this, why? Because it protects them. It protects them from inflation, the economic failure. Wow. But guess what? The Bible shows you it doesn't. Wow. Famine will still prevail. Isn't that something? That scripture is more alive than you think. 
It's more alive than some of you. <laughs> a lot of you are just deadbeat Christians, amen? It's more alive than you. Look at Revel uh, Revelation 20. Revelation 20. I want you to turn to Revelation 20. It's so scary, guys, about this digital currency system that people are saying that cash will end. There is no doubt about it. The time will come, and they're just waiting a couple more years or I don't know how much longer, but it's only a matter of time, guys, when everything switches and then the cash will no longer be king. Cash will no longer be king and everything will fall apart. People will switch to a digital world and a digital aspect. This is uh, one article from uh, Yahoo News, which, is, which piqued my interest. In Yahoo News, they say, uh, where are you? I lost that uh, article. Let's see. Come on, come on, come on. Ah, here you are. Okay. This is from Cornell, all right? One of their uh, economics professor from Cornell University. Title of the article is The End of Physical Currency Cash is Certainly Drawing Near. And Eswar Prasad, Cornell University economics professor, said, The end of physical currency cash is certainly drawing near. And cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, have certainly paved the way for that revolu revolution. Guys, it's only a matter of time. So then they're going to go digital. And when they go digital, and you might recall Biden was uh, welcoming that on the table for discussion, where the feds themselves, they're thinking about going through a digital currency system. I don't know if you've heard about that. So everything's, uh, so they're, they discussed talks about that, I think a couple weeks ago or last month. But it's no secret. You can find it easily on the news. So there's no doubt we're going to hit here. And the Bible told you in Revelation 13 that you can't buy or sell, save you have a mark. So it's all going to go through not a physical cash system. The Bible told you it's going to be a mark in the right hand or in the forehead. Pointing out that it's going to be digital then. Because everyone's doing stuff with their heads and with their hands to interact with the economy nowadays. But it gets even scarier where it points out to the mark of the beast where they call this soul bound. Didn't you know that? There are some who decide to use the term soul bound in reference to digital currency. This is from Business Insider. Title of their article, Ethereum's co-founder says, we'll soon use soul bound tokens to verify things like school and employment, all stored in a soul's wallet. Wow. They're non-transferable NFTs that he says could bolster people's social identities. Amen. Why? To fight scams, that's why. College, colleges could issue degrees via soul-bound tokens, and event organizers could verify a person's attendance. Oh, how about that? Isn't this great news, man? <laughs> We're going to go so bound, man. Here's some of the disturbing quotes that I read. It says here, an environmentally minded DAO, for example, could airdrop soul bound tokens, or SBTs, okay? to people that already have environmental action SBTs as a recruitment tactic. Butterin has dubbed these as soul drops. A person's SBTs would then be validated by other souls, meaning, or people who can vouch for you. And the credential or accomplishment you're earning a token for similar to how a LinkedIn connection can verify a skill of yours. All of these would be stored on a soul's wallet on the blockchain, not unlike software wallets used for crypto and NFTs today. 
According to Butterin and his co-authors, SBTs could specifically help push Web3 forward by decreasing reliance on centralized companies. Ah, so people get tricked into something like this because it's more autonomy on my part, yeah. independence on my part, mm -hmm. so that those big companies don't control me. <laughs> oh, aren't you a sucker, born every minute. By decreasing reliance on centralized companies and giving people more ownership of their digital selves. Now, isn't that disturbing? This is their own identity. Guys, they're, switch they're putting their own soul, their own identity wow. into this digital currency. Wow. Basically, that's what they're showing right here. Here, let me read this. As Butterin wrote in his January post, disgusting world of Warcraft. Oh, now you turn to Luciferian, occultic, witchcraft, uh, satanic stuff, huh? But it's World of Warcraft. It's not the same. No, I see that all the same, okay? It has to do with magic and everything. All of that kind of stuff, is, I see that all as satanic, okay? All right, there's no nice term, okay? It's not called white magic, okay? Discussing World of Warcraft soulbound items, making more items in the crypto space soulbound can be one path toward an alternative where NFTs can represent much more of who you are and not just what you can afford. Yeah, beep is appropriate for that one. Shock, okay? They associate your soul, your identity with, not, they don't call it 666 yet. Your soul is tied to a digital currency. What did the Bible say about the mark of the beast connected to soul? Revelation 20. Revelation 20. The Bible sees something here. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw that souls of them were beheaded, that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had, look at how these souls are tied right here. For the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. Why did the Bible say right here that the souls are the ones who got the victory against the mark of the beast? Why won't it say bodies? Why won't it say saints? Why does it say souls? Because it's a soul issue that's going on with the mark of the beast. And that's why those tribulation saints, when they undergo the tribulation, they have to protect their own souls. You know what all this is? Believe it or not, this rising gas price, all of this rising gas price is leading to what? A protection of your soul. Wow. That's hard to believe, isn't it? But that's how it all ties and leads down to, guys. How about that? How about that? Now, you know what's even worse? They can still get, a, you might say, why? We got to spread this information. They don't care. This does not pique people's interest, guys. People are not interested. People do not care about this. They'll drown it out, the truth. You might say, how so? That's so hard to believe. Title of the article from Axios, America more interested in Depp, her trial, than abortion. You know why? Because of, you just get the famous Hollywood, Will Smith. Amber Heard, Johnny Depp, and that will overrun all the information. You just set up these guys who can be the fallouts or who can be uh, receive the brunt end and the attention, and then the secret guys can still get away with their own things. Here's, uh, you'll be shocked. The average number of social media interactions per published article by select topic. The Amber Heard, Johnny Depp trial is 508 versus Joe Biden, which is 170. It's only 170. So that, that's why you don't have to, there's not much of that anger against Biden. He can still get away with some things. The Russia-Ukraine war, even smaller, 91. 91, so then they don't have to, but price inflation is even worse, 70. Inflation is only 70. But Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, 
all that attention. And then these wicked people, they can get away with, let's amp it up a bit. We're not going to get that much of a tension or people aren't, aren't going to get much upset about this because we just pull up a Amber Heard and Johnny Depp trial. What, what's going to be next, man? Kevin Spacey returns or something like that to Hollywood? Even worse is the, current, uh, is the pandemic situation. Yeah. Only 44. And this is from Axios. And you wonder why they can get away with it. And that there's not much of that kind of an uprising where it topples the government. No, you control information. You control information. Obviously, I'm not supporting a government rebellion, but what I'm pointing out is the reason why the government don't have to fear the people is because they're, they got their fallouts, their stuff in play. What people are more concerned about is a celebrity. How about that? How about that? All right, let's close with a word of prayer. God, my Father, I pray tonight's teachings have been eye-opening to the people and uh, made us more aware of how our world is falling out and how your scripture is, is becoming more fulfilled and that we don't follow like sheep the system of this world, but always be awake, not woke like the liberals, but awake out of this wicked system and to always follow your word the proper way, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.